Sadly, but not surprisingly, the American Heart Association may be bought and owned. And I'm gonna show you a very recent article with proof that this may actually be the case. Have you ever noticed just how unhealthy school lunches are? What about the lunch and the, the breakfast and the dinner for hospital patients, nursing home patients? What about our military service men and women, the food that they're forced to eat? Have you ever noticed just how unhealthy it is? Why is that? The first thing I wanna show you is this image here. All right, so what we're looking at right now is all of the companies who financially support the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. Obviously, right now, we're gonna focus mainly on the American Heart Association, but you can see on the left there, the food organizations that are supporting the American Heart Association and the AHA. So we see Campbell's, we see PepsiCo, we see Subway, Quaker, Kellogg's, Frito-Lay. I didn't know Fritos were beneficial for heart disease, but okay. Then we go into the smell section there where we see healthcare. Okay, we see Aetna, we see Kaiser Permanente, P&G. If we go down a little bit, we see Pfizer. We see Eli Lilly. We see even below that Colgate and a bunch of these other companies on the far right top. We see Costco, Safeway, Walmart, and below that CVS, Kroger, Walgreens. Lots of big names there. The ones I'm most interested in are the middle column and then the far left column as far as interesting organizations that are financially supporting the American Heart Association. So this is the foundation of what we're gonna start with first. The American Heart Association is the longest standing association in the United States that is a voluntary standing organization to fight and prevent heart disease. And it aligns very, very closely with its uh, food guidelines with the USDA. The reason this matters is that these guidelines are essentially what contribute to what goes into our school systems. So what our kids have for lunch, what they're recommended to eat by policy, what they can have in the school systems. Same with what goes in our hospitals, okay? What people who are sick and dying or need healthcare can actually have access to via food. This is what helps to define those guidelines. And then also just all of the guidelines that we've all ever had as recommendations as adults to reduce the chance of heart disease or stroke. The reason that the American Heart Association was actually founded was because in, I believe it was the 1950s, President Eisenhower had a heart attack. And up until that point, no one ever had really had heart attacks. So the world scrambled, we got the American Heart Association together. And the purpose of it was to create these guidelines to ultimately benefit people so that they wouldn't have to have heart disease or a stroke or anything like that. That is the sole purpose of this company and the purpose of these recommended guidelines. Like just, oh my God, the amount of heart disease that's exploded since then is crazy. So to me, in and of itself, like that's already weird, but moving forward, let's break down these recommended guidelines. And I'm gonna show exactly how even the data that's given by the American Heart Association can't even be trusted by the American Heart Association. So what I want to reference in this particular conversation is an article that came out recently by Nina Teicholtz. Nina is a total savage. She's an absolute badass and she is the leading person who is unraveling all of this information about companies and hidden sponsorships and kind of unraveling these areas here. She has a blog called Unsettled Science. Highly recommend you guys check that out. But that is what I'm pulling these references from. I'll attach that link below as well. It's stunning when you think about, you know, basically what do the guidelines say? And just to add another reason here of why they're so important, I'm sure pretty much every single one of your listeners and fans and followers try to follow uh, advice from their doctor and their nutritionist or their dietitian, and all those healthcare professionals are taught the guidelines. So this is what the guideline says. So we've all been there trying to be healthy on this diet. Eat more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low fat milk, and you know lean meat, not too much, and, um, and low fat dairy in general, and more you know nuts and seeds. This image here again is the foundation for this entire conversation as far as the American Heart Association potentially being bought and owned. Now, moving on to that, I'm gonna go into the recommended dietary patterns given by the American Heart Association to the American public to ideally decrease or completely avoid heart disease and stroke, all right? So what you're seeing right now is a list of all of these dietary recommendations from the AHA. So I'm gonna just kind of like top to bottom read it. First is a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, okay? Second is whole grains and products made up mostly of whole grains. 
that feels redundant, but okay. Third is a healthy source of protein, mostly plants such as legumes and nuts, fish, and seafood, low fat or non-fat dairy. And if you eat meat and poultry, ensuring it is lean and unprocessed. Mm. Fourth is liquid non-tropical vegetable oils. That feels weird. Fifth is minimally processed foods. Sixth is minimize intake of added sugars. Minimize intake of added sugars, okay? Seventh is food prepared with little or no salt. And then eighth is limited or preferably no alcohol intake. I lost count there, you guys. I'm not sure if it was seven or eight, but you get the idea. So that is the list of all of the foods that are recommended by the American Heart Association or the diet to follow to avoid heart disease and stroke. When I'm looking at Nina's article, she references two points here, two major points here that need to be called out as far as these guidelines. So the first thing is that she notes that these recommendations reflect some really major reversals since the American Heart Association's original dietary guidelines, which I'm putting right here, and these were put out in 1961. So these changes I'm about to reference, there are two of them, were very, very, very quiet changes that were made and the American Heart Association has made no effort, no effort to make this public information or announce it publicly as they should, given that these are the recommendations given to the public to be healthy and happy and to prevent the biggest killer in the country, yet nothing publicly has come out. So the first one that Nina puts in here is the low fat argument. And she puts in that low fat, the low fat diet is gone. This happened quietly in the mid 2000s with the words low fat simply disappearing from the American Heart Association's website. Confusingly, however, the group still considers you better off eating a low fat potato chip over the regular version. This would seem to reflect the principles of a low fat diet, but the American Heart Association will no longer say that overtly. By contrast, lean meat and low fat dairy continue to be encouraged due to their lower saturated fat content, not total fat. So what Nina's saying is that in 1961 with the initial American Heart Association recommendations, like we're seeing here, low fat was a huge factor to reducing heart disease at that time. If you guys remember, that was a huge push in the States is low fat, low fat everything. Let's have low fat this, low fat that, let's reduce fat because that will help us to not have heart disease. What she's saying is that in these recent components here, as far as the diet to have, it the, the, the organization basically removed this encouragement of low fat from its website in the 2000s without actually having a press release about that, without announcing it to the public, without explaining it to the public. It simply just whisked away off of their website. And that was one of the biggest factors as to what was causing heart disease. So for the American Heart Association to not like address that and then explain why to the public, but just instead quietly remove it from their website is strange. The second point that Nina makes is that the American Heart Association dropped its longtime cap on dietary cholesterol. So for a very long time, there was a historically capped 300 milligram per day amount of cholesterol. And that was the reason that for decades we avoided eggs. Now you can probably, you probably don't know that the cholesterol limit has been vamoosed since the American Heart Association has made no effort to communicate this major policy reversal to the public. So what she's saying is for, you know, the second part of what was making the American Heart Association recommendation so powerful was this lowering of cholesterol. So it was lowering fat and then lowering cholesterol. And there used to be a 300 milligram cap. That was for everything. That's why we have statins. That's why we talk so much about cholesterol, all these various foods that we can't have like eggs. Yet in these dietary recommendations, it's okay to have poultry. And beyond that, they made no announcement ever, 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 ever about limiting or taking off the cap for cholesterol, which is a huge factor. I guarantee somebody you know is on a statin and they believe that lowering cholesterol to 300 or less is the way to go. Literally, the American Heart Association made no out front effort, no PR effort, nothing at all to communicate this change whatsoever to the public. It seems as if lowering cholesterol to 300 milligrams is not the issue, not the sole issue at least, and also lowering total fat has, was never the, the, the way to go, but they don't wanna to admit to that, right? So those are the two biggest factors that Nina is calling out from this specific guidelines, the most recent one compared to the older ones. 
The final thing to note about the dietary guideline that's interesting to me is that if you look at the amount of sugar recommendation, it doesn't have a cap on the amount of sugar, which is super fascinating because if we look at the United States overall, we can see that so many people are overweight. I believe it's 42% of the United States today is obese, not just fat, I'm talking obese. And yet there's no limit to the amount of sugar that we should have in our diet, meaning we're not limiting the amount of sugar that a kid should have at school or the amount of sugar that a patient should have in the hospital. And what that makes me think about is this chart here, this, this list of companies that is financially supporting the American Heart Association. If we look at the food organizations, we can see that most likely these companies and the companies that these companies own for sure have a lot of sugar in their products that we consume. You know, I'm just making a kind of rash assumption here, but wouldn't it make sense that if there was a need to minimize sugar intake for heart disease that it would be recommended there? Yes, it would make sense if, however, the sugar companies are in a way sponsoring the American Heart Association, there might be greater incentive to not put a cap on it because that would not benefit the financial ties. Interesting thing to point out. So that's everything with the, with the most recent list of the dietary guidelines. Moving on from that, Nita then quotes in her article what's called the 2019 Evidence Review, which is basically the most recent undertaking with the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, where they examine the evidence available for each piece of dietary advice given by the American Heart Association. And so they do this by reviewing basically the quality of the data and the quantity of the data that the American Heart Association uses to create those guidelines. Again, these are the guidelines here. So this evidence review is basically reviewing the quality of these recommendations based off of the quantity and the quality of the data the American Heart Association used to make this list. What you're looking at right now is basically a chart that's kind of showing the quality of these recommendations by the American Heart Association. To make this make sense, I'm just gonna clarify a couple of things here. You can see that it's saying the recommendations for nutrition and diet, and there's a left column, which is green and yellow. You don't have to worry about the middle one for now, and then the right columns, which is the recommendations. So what these colors mean, green basically means strong, and only strong evidence can use the language of certainty for the general population, meaning the data quality and quantity is strong. It's good. The yellow indicates a moderate ranking, meaning the evidence is not very strong. It lacks foundation. What it's ranking is how much it decreases the potential of heart disease. So if you see that ASCVD in there, that basically means heart disease. Okay, so zooming out from this, if we look at this and understand what's going on here, this is actually measuring how good these food recommendations actually are. And so what's super interesting when we look at this is that at a glance, we can see that the only one on here that's actually good, the only one on here that's actually proving that it's certainly most likely correct is the green one, the very first one. Everything else is not actually strong data to prove that it's accurate. And the very first one, this is what's really interesting about what Nina brings up too, is that even the first one has faulty data backing it up, and I'll explain why. So it says a diet emphasizing an intake of vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, whole grains, and fish is recommended to decrease heart disease. And according to this survey, it's saying that that's strong, there's strong evidence to prove that. When, however, Nina dove into this research to see what they used to confirm that, she found that the strong ranking was actually only confirmed by one other study to prove those findings. And this study was to, to see if the Mediterranean diet was good to prevent heart disease. That article is here where it's basically showcasing that this was done in Spain. And the craziest thing about this is that in this study, they have different food products used than what was recommended by the American Heart Association. For example, in this study, they used olive oil, not seed oils. Yet in the recommendations by the American Heart Association, it's saying to use seed oils. What? Literally makes no sense. And then if you look into 
what it was using also it was saying to use fruits and vegetables and nuts and legumes and fish and all that but it's not saying to reduce saturated fat it's not saying to reduce red meat or to emphasize whole grains which is part of the dogma of the american heart association so in fact in that study that the green box was using to c confirm that that version of the diet would make sense that study was actually using olive oil it was using red meat and there was a ton of saturated fat in the diet in the American Heart Association version, there was no red meat. They were using seed oils and there was no saturated fat. It makes no sense. If you really are to look at this entire box here, you'll see that almost all of this can't be proven accurate. Basically all of it cannot because even the data that we did have confirming that that one might actually be accurate isn't even accurate in reporting. The only way that I can think to make sense of all of this contradictory information, confusing information, lack of information being shared by the American Heart Association is by going right back to this chart with all the companies who are sponsoring this organization to ultimately bring them revenue, bring them money and support their business. And so if you think about it from the American Heart Association's perspective, why would you? Why would you literally say that these organizations are hurting heart disease if they're giving you money? It's not based in logic or information that's gonna benefit our health. This is all coming from organizations that are ultimately looking to generate profit. And that's the sad reality of it. Now, this is not doomsday. This does not mean that we're all screwed. Ultimately, what this means is that we just have to eat actually real food and understand that the information that we're given from companies is ultimately there to generate profit. Typically, there is a reason why heart disease is still skyrocketing. There's a reason why there's so much processed food in every place that we go everywhere. There is a reason why carnivore and animal based is helping so many people. We have eaten that way ancestrally for literally years. It's not a surprise that what we ate in nature to get to where we are now is going to help us rather than eating foods that are given to us that were created in the last 150 years. So hopefully this gave a little bit of clarification for anybody out there who's trying to understand what to do with heart disease, how to navigate this world. My recommendation would be to always, always, always reduce processed foods. If you guys are looking to understand how to get started in a carnivore or animal-based lifestyle, watch this video here. Highly recommend that if you need to learn a little bit more information about anything to do with all the experts and what they think is the best approach because this can all be confusing, watch that video here. I've talked with all of these different doctors and experts and all that and I think this video perfectly summarizes what all of them say and what they have in common. So hopefully that helps, but ultimately you guys do my best to try to unravel the truth here and identify a source of reality so that all of us can invent our realities and be the person we wanna be. Look the way we wanna look, feel the way we wanna feel, act the way we wanna act, have the life that we want and not have our potential be held back by all of this information that's taking us down. So I hope you guys like this. If you did like it, please like it. Please subscribe if you like this kind of stuff. The more subscribers we have, the bigger the base we have, the bigger the guests we can have on to identify the truth and break this matrix. And always follow me on Instagram, message me there. I love talking with you guys on Instagram. It's so fun to connect. And um, anyways, you guys, really appreciate you. I'll see you on the next one.